behind. She was born into a world that tore women apart, had them say them ladies are weak. The noise in between her body and growing up barely gave her time to breathe. It was, you must be this because you, you wear skirts to this is your place as a girl to give sex to a man whenever he asks for it. Be nice. Nobody cared for the death of her dreams. She was not meant to be seen. Yet each time it was her turn to cross the street, somebody saw it fit to grab her hand and whistle. Whistle as if she were a stray dog, patting her behind, commanding and welcome attention. She was only visible when they wanted. Mama was too powerless to say anything, but don't play with boys, they'll hurt you. Nothing about daddy's home matches with her back, the kicks and snares that did not make very good music, only screams and nightmares. Why were these men still the ones making laws, paying for sex and saying what food they wanted cooked? Why did her body still want them so bad? Wasn't there another way out? to live away from the burden of being a woman whose own body still felt like a foreigner's because strangers decided what she must do, what she shouldn't do with it. Her cycles of blood muted for a while. She remembered the cast that neighborhood boys built into her with, her blind, um, with, her blind, with his blind angry rod that fatefully, that fateful evening after school. Rape is ugly, but for some reason these boys like it. Her stomach came of age with time. She feared the scorn of her family, ran away from home. The distant church felt like an old childhood friend who had no interest in rekindling yester memories of laughter and merry Sunday mornings. Something brewed inside her, resentment, confusion, and a child. One night on the news, they said mothers are dying in hospital, giving birth to their babies, the babies they hoped to live for. Where will women be tomorrow if they all die today? The world is sick enough, and somebody needs to stop sleeping on their job to keep women safe, for mothers are the first gods we see in flesh. She was not ready to die, 17 and so low in life. Sex was already her worst dream, didn't know who to report the neighborhood boy to. He went about his business like he'd done nothing to cause any earthquakes. Doctor at the hospital said abortion was illegal. He didn't want to go to prison. They only do it to women at risk of death and something like that. She couldn't remember much. But she didn't want to be a mother. She wasn't ready. She hadn't even known herself. What was it going to be like carrying a child? Yet she was one. Should she go to the crook in the ghetto to get rid of the fruit in her womb? Maybe she wouldn't come back like her friend Awino. Who has, been, who has never been the same since. Who to turn to? Nobody at home would believe her. I guess it meant it was time to leave this world, this rowdy, grinding, biased, unforgiving world. Two days after she was reported missing, they found a suicide note in her school bag with the name of the neighborhood boy and the last line that said, I'm the one you left behind. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. That is Onyango Otenu. He is a poet and he uses his platform, especially online, to talk about mental health. We'll be speaking to him in just a moment. He'll join us here as part of the panel. Here are a few numbers when it comes to mental illness in Kenya, by disorder, and why it's important for us to really be talking about this and to highlight it and to kill the stigma as much as possible. Depression disorder in Kenya accounts for about 45%, while anxiety stands at 16%. Self-harm depression stands at around 15 percent um, bipolar stands at seven um, development disorders at five percent as well as um Childhood behavioral disorder at another 5%. Psychophrenia at 5%, bipolitics 7%, and 2% is referred to as other neurological disorders. So that is a highlight of the mental illness in Kenya by disorder. Um, of course, depressive disorder being the highest, as I've told you, standing at 45%. This is why here on Weekend Express this morning, we're choosing to really highlight mental health, not only here in Kenya, but on the African continent at large. Onyango, it's so good. 
to be having you here. Thank you. Uh, we've come towards the tail end of the conversation, but I feel like it's important for you to let us know this. A lot of Kenyans, especially those who are active online, know you for how vocal you are and giving a voice to mental health here in Kenya. Why is it so important for you to use, especially the social media platform where a majority of young people are, to be having this conversation? Well, I think for me it's because, um, first of all, uh, the influence I have to have online conversation with people. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because young people are the majority of um, the citizens in this country. And a lot of us use online um, platforms for a lot of things. But we don't have enough conversations about our health online. We are not very um, savvy on how to speak about our pain online. And I, I think um, because, because of lack of structures also and uh, just not knowing how to articulate ourselves properly, uh, these very online platforms also breed um, a, a space for cyberbullying, which mm. I think is a huge place where uh, many people get you know, uh, depression from. So for me, uh, out of personal experiences, I love talking to people. I love making them understand that um, you don't have to die alone even if you don't have someone to talk to. Mm. So just having those conversations um, sort of help me help them. You know, I connect them to psychiatrists, to therapists, psychologists, and also just, you know, just talking about generally about life. Beautiful. Yeah. Speaking of structures, do you believe that Kenya's policies around health and more so mental health are strong enough? Mm. Well, we have the papers, you know. It, I, it's on paper. I, yeah, <laughs> I read um, there's a Kenya mental health policy. I don't know if you've talked about it. Uh, 2015 to 2030, it's aligned with the Vision 2030 mm -hmm. um, from the Ministry of Health. It's a very articulate document that very few people of us know about it mm -hmm. um, but to be honest there are people who are actually working very hard especially in machinani to sort of just uh, in government to sort of just help people with mental health issues um, one of that huge barriers in uh, we that came up in um, among the forums i've been going to is we have a, a situation with the language barrier okay for example um depression does not exist in luo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or kikuyu or mm -hmm. meru mm -hmm. The word that exists is madness, or that cuts across, it's madness. So people can't talk about what's not in their language. They, you wouldn't know how to communicate it to them, OK? By the time I was being born, um, AIDS was already an epidemic in, in this country, in this continent, yeah? From, late, from the 80s to uh, peak 90s, right? And so by the time I knew how to speak Luo, there was a word for AIDS in Luo mm -hmm. that didn't exist before 1980. So, I think one of those other ways to start helping people understand mental health is creating a word in our indigenous languages that's going to help them understand. So this is what this really is, and it's not madness anymore. Wow. You see, so I'm very passionate about creating communication because those um, language barriers um, makes it very difficult for practitioners to break it down to people oh. um, uh, in terms of creating sustainable solutions to deal with mental health. And I'm glad that you just gave an example of Kenya, but even that's even more of a bigger example even for the African continent at mm. large okay. where we can use our African languages yes. to talk about mental health in a very proper structure. Um, Michael, I'll bring into this because you are the psychologist mm -hmm. here. Do you agree with that? Otino is saying in regards to one structure, the policies that are there and one of the barriers is for people within your field is, is, is definitely language because how do you communicate to a Luo, to a Kikuyu, to someone in Turkana that uh, a conversation around mental health? Well, I, I agree. Um, what, what he's saying is that um, there's that challenge. Mm -hmm. I mentioned about the social cultural aspects. And uh, I, I liked what he said that uh, in maybe some communities, mental, uh, let me use the word illnesses, or maybe disorders, are you know, regarded as you know, madness, you know, so in quotes. But that's not, that's not the case. It should, and it should not be even like that. And that's why uh, I'm very happy as a country, now we have uh, the mental health policy, and it's, it's, a, it's a good uh, document. Um, and, and we need to have it uh, like uh, taken out there and for people to understand you know, exactly you know, what is happening at the policy level. And then now coming to the communities, I'm not even uh, sure that a number of maybe maybe most of the communities I'm not even I'm, I'm not sure that they have you know this kind of knowledge and that's mm -hmm. I'm very happy with mm -hmm. you know what Onyango is doing um, 
using the online uh, platform to get this message to as many people. Mm -hmm. But the, the policy is there. It's, it's a good document. And as a country, uh, I'm confident that we, we are right on uh, our path and it is going to be uh, OK. So I, I'm, I'm happy. At least we are somewhere as, right. as a country. OK. Yeah. Um, Onyango, before you walked in, um, Sam was talking to us about, for him, he hasn't relapsed yet because he's very aware and he's very keen on it. Um, for you, there are times that you've relapsed. And how do you get back on your feet? Mm. That constant. Because it's, it's, it's a constant improvement. It's a mm. constant buckle. You don't wake up today morning and you say, OK, fine. Mm. I choose to be positive, and life will go on, and nothing will happen. Because this is life. Things do happen. So how have you strengthened yourself through your relapses? For me, I read a lot. I read, I read a lot. Um, and when, when I got my last bout of depression early last year, I said, I really want to take care of this thing, because the next time it could be the one taking me down. So I had to start understanding where does it come from, why is it affecting so many of us. And um, I started reading, and I found out that it's been exist in, in existence for so long, and I'm just a very tiny part in the whole grid. Um, and that essentially means I, it's something that I can understand, so which means then it's something I can overcome. You know, um, Most of us don't overcome it because we don't understand it. Right? And so you can't cure what you don't understand. That's why we, we, um, psychologists can say, OK, this is wrong with you because they have understood what you're saying. Uh, so if you understand yourself, as Sam said earlier, um, then you, that self-awareness helps you understand this is where you are in your journey. You know you can't rush certain things. You know this is, you're supposed to be over certain things. I um, mean, for me, it's you know, just having very strong friends around me who are equally mentally stable um, for that emotional support, that spiritual support, which he also mentioned earlier, which is very right. important, right. Um, and just how much you exercise your mind. How has your spiritual support had any ripple effect for you? Well, um, I have a group of friends who helped me. They help me just be vulnerable. You know, when I'm not OK, when they can't even understand what I'm going through. But they are there. They are there. They, you know, let's go out, talk. Let's come home, cook. Let's watch a movie. Let's do something. All of that is spiritual. And you know, maybe from how, where we come from, Sometimes we think spiritual has to do with religion, but mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't always have to be that. You know, for people, some people it goes in there, some people it doesn't. But just taking care of your spirit is a very fundamental place. You know. Sarah, is there a right way to be there for somebody? Because I love what Onyango has just said. For him, going to a movie, cooking with his friends, mm -hmm. going out to dance and sing, for him that is his part of his spiritual growth. And and for him, his friends have been there. And I, I love what he said. They allowed him to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Is there a right way to be there for someone when it comes to mental health so it doesn't feel like it's awkward and your friends are not judging you? Is there a right way to be there for your friends? Yes, it's very important. We all go through problems. We all, no matter how big you're playing, we all go through you know some some things that weigh us down so the first thing that you can do to somebody is first of all have a listening ear listen don't charge them whatever maybe they have just done something which is they are really feeling like they're hating themselves they are they are closing their they don't want to talk to people first of all visit them show them that you love them show them don't even speak about the problem just relate with them as normally like you know the way we have related before mm -hmm. and then get to understand what happened to talk to me you know be the thing is listen to them first of all what led to their actions listen to them they people the people just need a listening ear listen and understand don't even judge me. Then from there, uh, we, now, we can now take a journey. Number one is being there for somebody, the presence, not just calling, not just calling, be there for them. Let's go to church. What do you think? What are you doing this afternoon? Let's go cooking. It's very important. It will, be, it will help somebody come out, and the more they are out, the more they now starting, you know, the, 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 their life starts coming back, the more they go out. So it's very important. You know, take them for, for whatever, for, for movies, go and do activities together, team buildings for them to be out, 
there doing activities together, it will really help somebody heal. Then also the other important thing is um, to, to be, I like the way he said, the word that he uses, vulnerable. Find some, you cannot be vulnerable to everyone. You cannot be vulnerable on social media. You know, people will judge you and hit on you and everything, which will add to the pain. So it's good, find a trusted friend. It could be even your pastor. You know, you know maybe you're feeling the, the challenge that you're having, you may want, not want to discuss with your peer. Find somebody who is more mature than you, somebody who is doing better than you in life, who is more successful. It could be your pastor or whoever. Tell them, me, I have this issue, I have this problem, and I think I need your assistance. Be vulnerable to them. Cry if you have to, but share out your problem. Mm -hmm. The thing is that, you know, we always think that, you know, the, the challenge I'm having is too private. No one else has to do it. It's too private. It's too shameful. And let me tell you, whatever is most private is most common. Some, it's most common. That, that's very important. Some for, for Onyango here, writing and speaking about especially poetry is his channel, his channel of release. For you, what is your way of um, coping? Uh, first of all, we do high school mentorship. So uh, when I go there speaking out with them, uh, I always feel like uh, passing out some knowledge and uh, it helps me cope alone. And also, um, the way they have said, uh, having friends. Uh, first of all, for me, I love cheerful friends. So, you know, cheerfulness is uh, it's like a disease that can be. It's, that, it's contagious. Yeah. Um, let me feel, let's wind up the conversation. I want Onyango to have the last say. Uh, what, what are your thoughts in just regards to our fight? And I mean our, I mean just not only in Kenya, but on the continent, our fight when it comes to mental health, mm. uh, where we've come from and where we're going to and how much more work needs to be done to mm. get this stigma outside there as your closing comment. Mm. One thing I'm very uh, passionate about right now is um, just the way the government was very well in, in uh, sensitizing people about HIV and AIDS, you know, in the 90s to early 2000s. We need to get to that place where they can put in resources to mm -hmm. teach people that this is going on. The same way today you can get into a VCT and not feel shameful. We need to people, the ordinary Kenyan, to know that, yeah, you, you need to take care of your mind, you can go to a hospital to check how your mind is doing. So when the ordinary Monanchi knows that, I think I'll be happy. Wow. And you know what? That's a fantastic note to leave the show right, with right there, that you can go to hospital and check on your mind and not have to feel eyes looking down on you. And hopefully as a society, mostly here in Kenya and the African continent, we'll get there as we're having more conversations around that. That is Onyango Otero. He is a poet. Um, Sarah Muni, a life coach, as well as Sam Gitonga, a student who is also sharing his um, story. And sitting closer to me was Michael Njeru, a psychologist, giving us a better perspective and helping us understand. Thank you so much for choosing we can express this morning and choosing to be part of this conversation even as we move forward when it comes to mental health. My name is Zinzi Kibiku. This is where we'll leave it. I'll see you at around 11 a.m. for an update of Stories Making Headlines. Then. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>